Amen. If we have any uh, young young folks here that need to head upstairs to Children's Church, and head back to the foyer and right up to the upstairs classroom. Uh, normally at this time, for everyone here and joining us online, you may hear our pastor say, good morning, my name is Michael, I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church of Elba. Well, good morning, my name is Andy, and I'm not the pastor here at First Baptist of Elba, um, but I'm proud to serve as a deacon, humbled, honored to do that, and also just humbled to be standing up here today and helping Pastor Michael. He's not feeling well, so he's home, I'm sure he's watching this morning, but um, it's good to be with you today, and it's been about 16 months or so since the last time I was able to share up here. Uh, but what I'm doing today, I would call more of a, um, it's kind of a tag team approach. Um, Pastor Michael, as you know, has been preparing and working so hard on a series uh, for us called Why. Um, and I would just ask if the guys upstairs, if you could just turn the television on for me there to that monitor, I'd appreciate that. Um, but uh, so he, what he did this week, I talked to Pastor Michael and he provided me with his notes and then said, study it, do what you need to do, move some things around, you know, delete, omit as long as I don't make any declarations of heresy concerning God's word. I don't want to get myself in trouble there. Um, so I have done that. Um, as you know, everyone here is different. So if you ever have the chance to come up and share, your speaking style may be different. So Pastor Michael and I are different people, uh, but I will stay faithful uh, to the teachings from God's word today. And it's a good one. So we are in week four of a new series for the next few weeks and months called Why? Uh, we have heard so far, why creation? Our second week was why gender? Last week was why marriage? And the series is going to seek to address that why question pertaining to a whole host of subjects and topics that concern us today. Uh, so today our focus is going to be addressing the topic of why fall. And I don't mean those funny videos that you might watch on YouTube of an hour and a half of people falling and getting hurt. Why fall? Right, Jill, it's not funny to fall at all. I've fallen in this parking lot many times. I've fallen in my school parking lot. That's not the kind of fall we're talking about. We're talking about the fall that we see in Genesis chapter three of 119. So, I'm um, sorry, one through 19 verses. Um, so if you turn there in your, in your Bibles, we'll get into God's word. So if you have your physical Bible with you, if you have a Bible app on your phone. Um, as you know, these scriptures will be from the English Standard Version. And our phrase to remember, the PTR, as you see up there, big decisions, big consequences. Okay, so it's a big message today, big decisions, big consequences. So we make a whole host of decisions in our lives. Um, some of them may be more simple, more mundane. What do I want to eat for breakfast today? What am I gonna to wear to school or work? Um, so on and so forth. Then you have the other decisions that can, that definitely do mold our future, and we may not be able to reverse them or undo the impact of them. Um, some may be, where do I want to go to college? That's a choice if you attend that school. That's part of your experience. You can't take that away, but that's, there could be a change in that plan. Uh, who, who may I marry in the future? Who I marry? We see so much of that in the news, and we had our our why marriage uh, sermon last week, our topic. Um, you may make choices what you do for a living. Um, you may make a choice what road you take to work. Uh, when I was 14, my best friend's mom went down a road she'd been down thousands of times to go to work, and she didn't come home that day. She had a car, tragic car accident. Um, we don't know that. It could be something so simple. Um, but why we're talking today, the impact of choice, the impact, big choices, big consequences. So there is one choice that Adam and Eve made thousands of years ago that we see as we're preparing in Genesis 3 that has shaped the trajectory, the, the whole course of human history, taking it from somewhere perfectly good, capital G good, and leaving it fallen and marred and broken. And the good news is for us that Jesus didn't leave it that way, God didn't leave it that way, but we have to deal with the fact right now that there was a fall. And knowing how and why it took place are important to help us function, to help us make the best decisions moving forward uh, while we're living in a, a fallen world. So really today could be called Why the Fall, the big one. So let's open our Bibles. You have it ready at Genesis 3, verse 1. Um, this starts right after Genesis chapter 2. I mean, how that happens. And God had just finished creating everything. 
including Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. So here we go, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. And I, I stop there for a minute because I'm pretty sure God didn't say surely die in chapter 2, verse 17. But again, this is the serpent speaking. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? as if God didn't know where he was. Verse 10, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. <laughs> then the Lord God, we'll get to that. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In verse 16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. Uh, Father, I just thank you for your word as we begin. Uh, Lord, just bring these truths forth. Thank you for uh, the time of study and Pastor Michael. Thank you for the time of study for himself uh, and reflections. And God, but it's your truth and your word to come forth this morning. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So a little context and background. Uh, so the book of Genesis written by Moses, the author of the first five books, the Pentateuch, is part of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, you could sum it up by saying perfection ends abruptly. It's a, perfection comes to a very abrupt end. So this is right near the beginning of creation, as we said. Uh, the audience written for the Hebrew people, for God's people, to understand their present state and how to move forward. So let's set the stage. God created the universe. He created everything in it. Perfect fellowship, perfect harmony. Man loves his wife well, okay? Woman loves her husband. There's perfect union there. Everything is going great. So again, our phrase to remember, big decisions, big consequences, okay? And let's go to key point number one. If we could get number one up there, there we go. The birth of sin. Verse one, we find the questioning of God's good plan. So here you have the serpent, more crafty than any other beast. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now there's a lot of debate, you can look back in, in scholars and history, of the serpent itself. Some people believe it was not Satan, specifically. Now we believe, I believe, that the Bible teaches it is Satan because he was the one that rebelled against from God in heaven. Um, in Hebrew, the Nahash is the word for serpent. 
typically in Hebrew associated with Satan. So we have that connection from those, that language. Um, Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15 tell us. They give us a description of what happened to Satan. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Now, the serpent, how it appears in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Revelation 12.9, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Also Revelation 20, verse 2, And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And if you want to look at another ancient language in Greek, uh, the word for serpent is ophis. That word shows up in astronomy and constellations. That word directly translates to serpent or whom the Hebrews referred to as Satan. So there's a direct reference. So how, how does Satan start this attack? How does he begin this attack? Well, he questions God's plan, and he misquotes his instructions. How many of you have ever, ever been misquoted before or been the victim of uh, misquotation? You think, well, didn't I say that? Yeah, I thought so. But he knows specifically what he's doing, and he wants to put that doubt, that little seed of doubt in Adam and Eve's mind about the love God has for them. Now, this is the point right here when I read this and you read this. This is the point where Adam should have stood up, taken that snake, and, be like, <laughs> and put an end to the deception right there. But there is debate. There is, there is debate. Um, this is a little bit of, of research that I did myself. Some scholars say, okay, Adam was there with Eve, and, but he was a bystander. He was an observer. He didn't speak up. Um, but he was there, even though he knew himself God's instructions. We have to remember that. Adam received those from God in chapter 2. He knew. Others say, well, Adam, it's because the text unclear. Adam wasn't there, but then he, he is there. Um, he comes later after the conversation with Eve and Satan. Um, and then she offered, she offered the fruit and he took some um, because of some devotion to, to her and um, also, but he knew. He knew what the instructions were. But to me, either way, they both knew what was right. They both knew what that commandment was. And I do believe Adam was there, uh, but it's interesting to read scholarly thoughts, scholarly debates on the text as it is written. Now, with all that said, the failure of our nation, failure of our, our communities, our families, it's not going to be because of anything else. Uh, men, we have a charge to stand up. We're charged, as we learned last week, to lead our families. We've been given that role to be the spiritual leaders in our family. And we have to be on guard for the minds and hearts of First of all, ourselves and how that relates to leadership in our family, our wives, our children, um, and if that extends out to grandchildren, however that affects that family unit, um, that is our charge. So in verses 2 and 3, we see answering with truth. So here's, here is the woman's response. Verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, Eve answered truthfully. That's all she knew how to do at that moment, because she had free choice. She has the ability to believe the lie, but she holds her ground at first, but she didn't really have any support. Uh, verses 4 and 5, this is what uh, Pastor Michael called seasoning with truth. I like to call it sprinkling, little, little truth bits in here. Uh, we have lies sprinkled with some truth. Verses 4 and 5. So here comes the serpent. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, the death that God had pronounced for all who ate of the, tr of the 
on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a spiritual death and a physical death. They would lose their spiritual placement, their physical placement. They would succumb to things like disease, physical death, and the separation from that perfect fellowship they experienced. That would become their reality. That would enter reality on earth. Now, Satan, did he want to mess stuff up for Adam and Eve? Did he want, was he jealous? Probably, yeah. He was a fallen angel. He was created to serve God as a heavenly being, but he was not given the image of God as Adam and Eve were. He was different. He was jealous of that relationship that, that they had with God. Now, there was an early church father. I probably will mispronounce his name. I know his first name was John. That one's easy. Um, and they had actually given him a different last name, which translates into Golden Mouth. That would be quite a nickname, wouldn't it? Someone called him Golden Mouth. Uh, he had the ability to, to uh, translate and, and, and bring forth knowledge from whatever you're reading or teaching. But um, John Chrysostom, that means Golden Mouth. He was an early church father. He was a bishop of Constantinople, uh, which is, is Istanbul today. And he wrote a collection of homilies on Genesis. And he said, do you see how the devil led her captive, handicapped her reasoning, and caused her to set her thoughts on goals beyond her real capabilities? in order that she be puffed up with empty hopes and lose her hold on the advantages that were already afforded her. He, the woman, she had it. You've had it. But do you see, you, you play on desire, you play on these emotions, and we get off track. So in verse 6, we see that sin is a choice. Remember, big choices, big consequences, there's decisions. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, in 1 John we can, we can see some, some understanding. Uh, but after Adam and Eve allowed Satan to continue to speak, he told a lie seasoned with a little truth sprinkling of truth. They were already made the image of God. They were like God in many ways. However, he created them without the understanding of good and evil. They also walked in spiritual perfection with God. The part he lied about was foundational. He said, surely you won't die. But that's exactly what God said would happen. That word surely, he, he, it's exactly what God said. And after this, Adam and Eve made their own choice. We might call that a sin of commission, something that you do willingly. You're committing this act. So what do we notice about this? Let's look at 1 John 2, 16. It says, I'll read this for you. It says, for all that is in the world, and this comes right out of the Genesis of, um, verses, the desires of the flesh, okay, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So what do we have to guard? What do we have to make sure we guard? These things. You could say the first one, appetite. In verse 6, we hear all three of these things in Genesis 3, verse 6. Genesis says it was good for food. She saw that the tree was good for food. First John calls it desires of the flesh, something physiological, uh, a desire. Also, verse 6, Genesis, delight to the eyes. So our, we have an appetite, we also have our eyes. First John says it's the desire of the eye, something pleasing, nice to see, nice to look at, uh, to lust after, or to covet. And the third one, pride. Genesis says to make one wise. First John refers to it as the pride of life, our own greatness. Even as Golden Mouth said, John Chrysostom, uh, puffed up, puffed up with empty hopes, lose those advantages. Those are the things we must be on the lookout for, the appetite, our eyes, our pride. They're at the core of every major sin. Sin is sin, but they're at the core of sin, and this is, it's one of the root issues where it grows from. So let's go to key point number two. We have birth of sin. Now we have the response to sin. Genesis 3, 8 through 13. So when we fall to sin, we react in the same way. We think the thing to do is to run away from God in whatever form that takes. The opposite, in fact, is what is true. We need to run to God when we make mistakes. Say, oh yeah, sure, Andy, that's easy to read off a paper. It's a lot harder to do, I know. 
Adam and Eve were the first model for the wrong response. The first model for the wrong response. Let me encourage you, don't run and hide as they did. But verse 9, God seeks us still in our sin, in our condition. Verse 9 says, the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? Why? Because God reaches out to connect to us even in our sin. And he did this with Adam and Eve. Colossians 2, 12-15 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. Gone with all of its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So, who's pursuing us? God is the great pursuit of us. He's never going to let go. We never let go, never let go, never let go. We just sing about this. If we belong to him, no matter what, we can sing that song. There is nothing that can separate us from him. He takes away all the barriers to keep us in that right relationship. And it was worth everything. It was worth Jesus' life. You were worth Jesus' life. So verse 10, what do we find after God seeking us? We find false fear. False fear. Verse 10 says, I, mean, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. In other words, I was aware of your presence, God, and because of the awareness of my sin, knowing that, God, you are the ultimate authority, I hid. Now, there's a number of problems here. Number one, God is omnipresent everywhere, always. So this new awareness of nakedness did not cause God to be more aware or less of their sin. God knew. It only caused Adam and Eve to become more aware of it. That was the new reality. It's like, boom, oh, awareness, production of fear. It's like a direct equation. And also, since God can already see everything anyway, when something becomes exposed, it's not time to run and hide. It's the time to be asking for help. And we can all benefit from the understanding of that mindset. Why do we run and hide? Or don't run and hide because God knows it all anyway already. Now, verse 11, we see we could say uncovering the truth of our sin can be painful. And I mean it's a lot more painful than ripping off of a Band-Aid. Okay, you uncover something. Yeah, ah, Band-Aid, that hurt. Okay, I had a shot here this week, a tetanus thing. Ripped the Band-Aid off. Didn't hurt that bad. Right? Didn't hurt that bad. But this, uncovering the truth, is painful, can be painful. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Already knowing the answer. Because God doesn't, it's not a band-aid. God takes, um, as Pastor Michael describes it here, the scalpel to our lives, of surgery to be done. He starts asking questions even though he knows the answers to them. What he's doing is helping us root it out and understand and identify. Here it is. Let's call it what it is. And let's get to the point of where we understand what went wrong. Where did this breakdown happen? Um, so it's like if I, I never did anything wrong as a child, but I know some of you, when you're wrong, maybe you snuck into a cupboard you weren't supposed to be in or the cookie jar, and you come to your child and you ask them, um, you know, I, you find the empty cookie jar, you come, the child's got crumbs all over them, and um, the child's like, oh, I don't feel good. And you say, did you eat the whole cookie jar? No. Uh, well, you know the answer. The, the evidence is plain. Um, it's not hard to put those two and two together. Um, even for me, I can do that. So what we're going to see is we're going to see how Adam reacts to the question when that layer starts to be peeled back to his heart, um, start to peel back the wickedness of his heart. So verses 12 and 13 starts my one of my... Um, Favorite parts as an elementary school teacher, the blame game. It's like the, the, the blame game. Here we go. The man said, uh, yeah, the woman who you gave to be with me, uh, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? 
The woman said, um, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So here we go, the finger pointing starting very early. We've fallen, and here we find ourselves, just like an elementary classroom. No, who did this to me? So what does Adam, Adam do immediately? The blame game starts. Woman did this, right? Eve, woman said, no, nope, serpent did this. God didn't argue with them. He didn't make them feel bad. He didn't use shame. He didn't beat them over the head. He just gave them the consequence. The action, right, was big decisions, big choices, big consequences, because the consequences often speak louder than any words. Uh, but we do the same thing. We blame others even when we are directly confronted with sin that is entirely our fault because it is entirely our what? Choice. That's that power of choice. So let's get to um, our point number three. So the birth of sin, the response to it, and the results of it. So we'll be in the last section of verses here, 14 through 19. So here we go, some results. We're going to have four sections. First, the result for Satan. Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. Right? That sounds like that's a new position maybe for the serpent. Now, your belly, and you will eat dust the day, all the days of your life. And God wants to, to illustrate that direct placement. He has, um, Satan has rebelled. He's already fallen from heaven. Now he's misled the perfect creation, first man and woman. And he wants to, the world to know how Satan will be treated. You're going to be lower than well. You're going to be on your, not even crawling. You're going to be on your belly eating dust. What is the result for mankind? The second one in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. All right. It seems like a huge blow to man right now in this passage. God is encouraging us, although, as we read this, because he is, even at the moment of punishment for sin, telling us how it's going to end. It's, it's looking ahead. There's going to be tension between the offspring of Adam and Eve and Satan. They will, they will fight. They will fight it. Furthermore, we get this allusion to Christ. To Jesus, who will and who would in the future conquer sin and death at the cross and would have nails driven through his feet. And Satan's power and control and the results of sin would be crushed at the cross, thus Satan's head being crushed. And Jesus not only deals that, that crippling blow at the cross to Satan's power, but he sends him down to the lake of fire and destroys him for good in the future. And um, another piece of commentary from a writer named um, Matthews it says, for the serpent, the penalty is just humiliation. And the consequence of his sin is his defeat by the woman's offspring, by Jesus. Um, now, another church father, Arrhenius, said, the enemy would not have been justly conquered unless it had been a man made of woman meaning Jesus. And it's a very important distinction. Um, so in, the, in an ancient study Bible text, um, Arrhenius was a disciple of Polycarp. We've talked about him before. Who Polycarp himself was a disciple of John. So you've, you've got this direct connection. And he spent his life defending orthodoxy, um, orthodox Christianity, and fighting a lot of the heresies in the church. So why is this important? The enemy would not have been justly conquered unless it had been a man made of woman. Because if you can refute that statement that Jesus came in the form of man by woman, then every other text in the whole Bible itself can be disputed. If you can dispute this, you can dispute everything. So a statement like that, the enemy would not have been justly conquered unless it had been a man made of woman to conquer the enemy, is important because it's a direct consequence. It has to be. That is true. So we have the result for Satan, the result for mankind. Let's look at verse 16, the results for woman. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. The result for the woman, even though she was deceived, and Adam could have stopped this, is that her pain would be multiplied, and there would be strife between the husband and wife while the husband tries to leave. 
Now, as we uh, was shared last week as well, uh, men, this isn't an, an excuse. Those of you who are married, to not treat your life with uh, treat your life of life, excuse me, to not treat your wife with love, or wives not to respect your husbands because of the fall. Because of that, we're now bent towards sin, and it is far easier to have strife than unity. Unity takes work. Think about that. It's easy to argue to, to, to have that strife. So we have to daily work at this. It's hard work. And um, the pain aspect that's mentioned for women is unfortunate. Um, Pastor made note here about something as gracious in our world as an epidural for, for a woman who's giving birth. I mean, what a, what a gift um, to have that. Our personal story, Kristen and I, um, our first child uh, with Aubrey being pregnant was not easy that delivery day or what we thought would be the delivery day. Um, hours upon hours upon hours of labor and no progress, like forward and like okay, and then nope, not yet. And there were issues with Aubrey's um, oxygen level, her fetal heartbeat was going up and down and up and way down. And it was very, very scary. Never never been parents before, didn't have a manual for that, other than the Bible, they know it's just you're gonna be a parent in a couple hours. Um, and all of a sudden as a dad, I can't I can do nothing. I can't pray, I can't be there for Kristen. It was very helpless. And then when the doctor came in, Dr. Fairbanks, she came in with some scrubs. She said, Dad, put these on. We have to do an emergency C-section. You have about a minute. In the bathroom, who wow, who get the scrubs on, not knowing anything. I think everybody in our whole family was there in the birthing suite. They have a window. Everybody's like, I just remember seeing my name, my grandma, my everybody, my mother-in-law, all their faces crammed around this little window, and we're in there. I'm in there sweating buckets, thinking, oh my goodness. Um, this is something Kristen has to, to experience, whether natural birth, C-section, whatever, the fear, the pain, anything that can come along with that, and I can do nothing. I was helpless. Um, but thankfully, that, that was fine. Um, Aubrey didn't breathe for, it felt like an eternity, but she is healthy, and, and we were able to, uh, they were able to deliver her, and uh, Kristen was able to come through that. But there's recovery time. It's not easy. Childbirth in any form is not easy. Um, so that is mentioned here. Um, but as you endure this, ladies, we praise God for you. Men are wimps. We're wimps. I tell you, we're wimps. I, I tell you, some of the men I, I work with, I'm like, guys, you are, you're terrible. Uh, we could never do that. I could never do that. Are you kidding me? I could never do what Christy did. Right, Bruce? Char told me. She told me. Right? We're wimps. But, but as you endure that, what the Bible says would be a result for a woman, as you endure that, you're fulfilling that. That's a consequence of the fall. But look at the blessing of children, grandchildren. The process, yes, can be difficult, very, very painful. Uh, the recovery can take a long time, but what a blessing. Now let's look at the results for man, uh, verses 17 through 19. Because to Adam he said, and here, here is the list, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, men, I wish it went this way, but there are a variety of consequences for complacency and for not leading your family. Because Adam, again, had a choice as well. And he will, and did and we still do, along with the rest of mankind moving forward, have those consequences. And in my, um, I was able to get a new study Bible recently, and down here a note in the section says that sin and death now became Earth's realities. They're here. And I thought, whoa, that's a good way to put that. Because of you, let's go through the list. Cursed in the ground. Cursed is the ground. Can you imagine how Adam felt? God saying that to you. The ground, the earth, which I have made perfect, is now cursed. Ooh. Number two, pain you shall eat. Okay? What we eat, it won't always be um, great produce. You could have bad batches in the fields. Sometimes it's food that could make us sick. That happens. Sometimes we won't be able to eat at all because of other ailments. Can't, can't eat at all. Third one, thorns and thistles it will produce. It's not always going to be a good harvest. The, the ground is going to bring forth weeds. Everyone loves those. Weeds and thorns by the sweat of your face. That means it'll be hard work. 
Nothing will be easy. Nothing easy will come. Another study note in my Bible here said, work itself was not a consequence of the fall, but that work will now become toil, which means great heart. Toiling every day. Now, now I know the, the, the what is it, seven dwarves, you know, whistle while you work, you know, high roll, it's off the work, but no, you know, it's, it, they're not toiling, they're getting diamonds out of the mine. It, it's like, come on guys, really, your job's not hard. But this will become toil, hard work. And this will be your lot until you return to the ground. Oh, great. Physical death is the ultimate reality for us if Jesus doesn't come back during our lifetime. So life is fragile. Didn't have to be that way, did it? I, I have two co-workers. Um, I was sharing this with a few people. I was sharing it with my sister yesterday. Uh, I had two co-workers this week who lost loved ones days apart. Uh, my literal next-door neighbor at school in the room, her husband died suddenly. Uh, there were health complications. I don't know what. Um, 61 years old. Um, passed away. The day before, I, I, I keep things in school all over the place in storage. I have things everywhere. So... Um, one of the secret closets is in her room. And I went in and I said, um, I'll withhold her name, but I said, hey, I'm sorry to bug you, I just have to get something. She said, oh, you can come on in, you're fine. And she goes, you know, I haven't talked to you in a long time about your wife, how's she doing? And I thought, man, you know? And the next day, her, her husband's gone. But she took the time to talk to me about how Kristen's doing, how she's feeling since her cancer treatment. And now the next, and I haven't seen her since then. She's obviously been out of school. And then um, another younger coworker of mine, um, his dad had been in the hospital for about a month and was recovering, was doing fine, was doing better, um, was meeting thresholds, and the next day he was gone. And he's a lot younger than me. I lost my dad at a young age. I was 32. Um, and he's, this gentleman's a little older than me, but I thought, you don't know. You don't know. And I've had a chance to speak with him and and encourage him, but I'm encouraged, even though in consequences and circumstances like that, and we all have those stories, due to the fall, we have, those are our realities on earth right now. We have the grace and the hope and life through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I think of the celebration for Janet's mom yesterday. What an uplifting day. A lot, of, a lot of emotions, yes, but I heard a lot of laughter, positive memories, all those good things. I heard nieces downstairs talking about about her, um, just I was within earshot of some conversations, and uh, what Pastor Bill was able to share, and the connection between Cindy and, and Janet's mom. I didn't know that. That was just so encouraging to me. Exa a perfect example of that encouragement in the because of the grace and the hope and the life we have through Jesus. How do we know that's true? Let's look at Romans. Um, if we, I'll read Romans five twelve through fifteen for you. We call this death in Adam, but life in Christ. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come, but the free gift is not like the trespass. Pastor Bill talked about this yesterday at the service. For if many died through one man's trespass, okay, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So in closing for us, we have these three points. The birth of sin, the response to sin, the results of sin. So where do we go? Where do we go from here? Where do we find ourselves? Or I should say, where do I find myself? Where do you find yourself today? Um, Pastor Michael describes it in four groups. He's um, on his notes here. You could be in the group that's pursuing God wholeheartedly. Are you perfect? No. But keep it up. Encouragement for you. Look for blind spots. There's, there's a lot of them. When I drive my wife's car, I can't stand it. It's got this big beam in the back window. It is a huge beam, and I can't, I, it's, a, it's a blind spot for me. I'm sure she does fine, but, but I can't see, barely see these notes up here. Um, but look for those blind spots in your life. Just like, hey, no one's a perfect driver either. We have them. But keep it up. Just like if you don't have any uh, traffic tickets, good job. So if you're pursuing God wholeheartedly, keep that up. 
Are there areas you're not aware of? Be mindful of that. Second group could be the struggling group. You're a believer who keeps being entangled by their sin. So I think of that like, uh, like you're caught, you see those movies, people are caught in the ocean in a net, it's like being in a parachute, you know, terrifying feeling. So maybe you get out of the net and get trapped back in it again. Um, you're the back and forth type of thing. You feel remorse and shame, but still, still struggling. Um, or maybe the lost group. You don't have any issue with sin or problem, and you practice it because you don't know any better. But we've heard, those of you here today, we've heard from God's word. Uh, but there's the lost group. And then there's the confused group. You think you're saved. Maybe the assurance is, is wobbly. But you practice sin. And that can prove perhaps that salvation is not accurate. Maybe we have some work to do there. Um, and just another, another note that came out of the study notes here. Just remember, sin always produces separation from God. Temporary, like it can be with, with, with sin, it, it can distract, detach, right? We have to be mindful of those things. So if you were in the, the groups one and two, pursuing God wholeheartedly or struggling, encourage, we give encouragement to you from God's word. Groups three and four, I mean, if you're lost, confused, if you're not sure, there can be salvation. It can be salvation or rededication and encouragement. So the challenge to us as the church here today, invite people to church, share the gospel, Here's what we need to do, though. We need to tell people that we don't have it all together. I don't, I don't have this all perfect. Um, First Baptist Elba, not perfect place. That's why all are welcome here. But we'd like to invite people to come. We'd like to invite people listening right now that might be saying, what's this First Baptist Church of Elba all about? Invite you to come. See what we're about, what kind of community we are. We're not perfect. Okay? We all have sin to deal with. But we'd love to come alongside each other and go on this mission together as we say to reach the community. Right? Now, will there be bumps along the way? Sure will. But I'm excited. We're excited. Pastor Michael's excited, wants to invite all of us and invite you as a church to encourage people to come and share the vision. So if you're here today, as we close, if you don't have that insurance, you don't know for sure you've ever put your faith and trust in Jesus um, as we share every week, every week Pastor Bill shared it a little bit differently yesterday, but it's still an ABC message. A, you admit. You see the Bible in Romans 3.23. All have sinned. Everyone's sin, uh, sinned and comes short, fallen short of the glory of God. B, believe. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. And you know death is separation. And the gift of God, though, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you admit and believe, you can confess with your mouth. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. If you do that and you believe in him, that you will be saved. No doubt. No doubt. Um, so as we close in prayer this morning, I hope that this has been encouraging for you. It can be a passage that we read and say, oh, oh, yeah, I know. Sin, now I've got to confront it. I've got to peel the back the layers. I've got to look at those, um, those things, those things. Um, big decisions maybe I've made, they do have big consequences for good and, and sometimes for bad. But we have that hope. We have that confidence in Jesus Christ who was that one man who came for all. All can have eternal life through him. Um, so let's pray this morning um, as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. God, thank you for these few minutes of truth that we could glean from your word. God, I thank you for um, the person, your, your person you sent me, Jesus, how you became flesh. Here we celebrated that just last month, looking at and walking through the Christmas season and the story, but it's so much more than that. God, that you are alive. You sent your son. You sent Jesus, fully God and fully man. And that Jesus, right now, we know you are alive. God, and that right now we can, if we're not sure, that right now in this moment, we can admit we can believe and we can confess that Jesus is Lord and that, Jesus, you will come and live. You will make that new believer reborn. We will be born again, a new birth for a new life. Jesus, thank you for all who are listening here. Thank you for those who are listening online. I pray that this has been um, a message as we walk through these why questions. But why fall? Why the fall, God? I pray that we have a, just a little bit better understanding today 
and that we can go home and do some self-reflection, um, that we can answer and say, where would I, what group would I be in? Um, where, where do I find myself right now in this moment? And that it's not, God, you're not chasing us um, to, to attack us with shame. You are you're chasing us because you love us. And you love each person here. I thank you for that truth. I, I thank you, God, for that hope we have. That we have hope for eternal life. And we can have that assurance right now, today, in this moment. And that is definitely something to celebrate. That is the greatest gift of all. Uh, bless your people here this morning, Lord, and all who are listening. And just as we go from this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Thank you. Just a reminder for all members.